my worst enemy The flesh that's covering me Brings me down to my knees Welcome to Sermons in the Park a ministry exploring biblical truth from the Word of God, focusing on the truths that help us in our daily walk with Christ in every aspect of our lives. Now, here is your Reverend, Jamie McCaskill. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to an all-new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend, Jamie McCaskill. I want to take this time like I do each and every week just to welcome you all back. It's an amazing and beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, this this weekend is, of course, Labor Day weekend, so for all of you who work, happy Labor Day. I'm hoping you all are enjoying your Labor Day weekend, spending time with your family and all that. I know last week, guys, we didn't have a sermon, but you did get that special episode that was the uh, interview with Robbie Heck. Um, you probably just heard a little bit of his music, just a clip, a snippet, if you will of his music at the beginning. Um, I want to thank him for sending me his album so we can do that. If you can, guys, go support him over on Rob Robbie Heck Music. I'll put some links in the in the, the bio down below uh, where you can find his music and his um, all of that. He's got this special event coming up in September later this month. I'm sorry, Robbie, I don't remember the date, but uh, I'll put that below as well. You know, make sure you guys show up and help him out. It's a, he's a Christian hip-hop artist. He also does a little bit of rock and gospel and all that good stuff. He's great. and He's a wonderful guy. If you listened last week, you did hear that interview. He's a really wonderful man. He's really, really, uh, really friendly. I, I enjoyed spending time with him um, at the library there. We talked quite a bit before and after the interview. Um, I really did enjoy uh, meeting him and spending time with him. So, Robbie, thank you for that. Thank you for allowing me to interview you for the podcast and the YouTube channel. It was, like I said, it was it was a blast. I really did enjoy it. So uh, let's bow our heads and thank our Heavenly Father for all the great and wonderful gifts He's given us. Heavenly Father, we come to you again to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of friendship with some, of the, some other humans here on this planet, the gift of friendship with the animals, the, the gift of the blue sky the water that we drink and the food that we eat and the, uh, the green grass, the blue sky, the, the fact that we woke up this morning that we were able to breathe and get up out of bed and walk around, you know, the, the gift of being able to, the energy to go work, all of these are gifts from you and we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I thank you, Father, for uh, the chance to interview Brother Robbie last week. Like I said, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. I pray, Lord, that his his event this September goes well. That he gets a lot of people. I want people. I pray, Lord, that the people just show up in mass and 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 just show how wonderful we are. That we can all be to one another. The fact that, that it would be beautiful to see all those people show up, Father, in Your name, to praise You and to enjoy the music of Robbie. And I'm going to pray for all this in the name of your, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, if you've been following along here on Sermons in the Park, you know that what we do, we do expository sermons. We do book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Sometimes even, yes, word by word, because words do change, don't they? Uh, and, and so we, we, go, we, we go that route. We break it all down. And if you've been following along, you know we've been doing Genesis. Uh, this week we're, up, we're, we're in chapter 41. Which two weeks ago we started and we ended at, at verse 42. Um, and we're reading about Joseph here, right? And Joseph is before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is telling him about his dream. So uh, we're just going to pick up right where we left off. Genesis chapter 41, verse 4. Genesis chapter 42. Or, sorry, again, I'm making mistakes, aren't I? That's human. I'm human. That's why you see right now I don't edit these videos, or I would have fixed that. Uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 42. And we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 57. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. 
And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made, his, he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, I'm going to butcher this, so be ready, Zaphnath Paniah. And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities the food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons, before the years of the famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On bear unto him. And Joseph called the name of the, of the firstborn Manasseh. For God said unto him, Hath made me forget all my toil, all my fa father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people came to Pharaoh, I'm sorry, cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all the land. So what do we do? We go back that first verse we read. We reread it. And then we, we, we break it down. Right? So let's reread verse 42 because that's where we started. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. So we see a mention here of these ring, right? These vestures, these, this gold chain. All of these, of course, are, are emblems of Joseph's office, right? The, um, the reward of clothing, of jewelry. All of this are things that would be suitable to the rank that Pharaoh had, uh, had, had given to Joseph, right? Joseph was now a vizier, or if you prefer the term as we use it now, a prime minister, right? He, he is second in command only to Pharaoh. Just like we saw back in verse 40, right? And also in uh, chapter 45, verse 8, we'll see this. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me the father of Pharaoh, a father to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. If you go down to, while we're here in this chapter, go look at verse 26, where we read, And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Now, with that ring, right? Joseph is wearing a royal seal. 
he he has authority okay he has authority to uh to uh, um make transactions to buy things to sell things all these things that would uh, affect the uh state on behalf of pharaoh right so in the next couple of verses we're going to see him he, 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 he receives, if you will, other rewards or awards of that promotion that he's gotten. Uh, in verse 43, we're going to see him receive his, well, his transportation. Okay? He, he also receives an Egyptian name in verse 45. He receives an Egyptian wife in verse 45. He also, we also see the people are commanded to show affection to, to Joseph to, to show a difference to him because they're ordered to do what? they're ordered to bow the knee okay now, in verse 43 I want you to remember this God is the one who revealed the dreams um, and, a, and he did this in a very rare display through pagans right and, and he did it so that Joseph would be able to be established as a leader there in Egypt because you see, when he was, when he was, okay, when he was a, a leader in Egypt, God could then use him to preserve his people. Because this this famine, yes, it's going to stretch out all the way into Canaan, all the, as we read all over the world. God cares for his people. He wants to see his people, you know, prosper. He wants to see us do well, and. So he, he fulfills his promises, just like he does right here with, with, with uh, Joseph. So let's look at verse 43 now. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee! And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. So... Do you, do you, did you see where, where, where uh, Joseph rides? It says in the second chariot. This was, uh, the reason he did this was that way people could see that Joseph is now second in command to Pharaoh. Now, Tutmosis, uh, who, Tutmosis III, just to be exact, he told his newly appointed vizier this. He said, Look thou to this office of vizier. Be vigilant over everything that is done in it. Behold, it is the support of the entire land. Behold, as to the vizierate, behold, it is, now, it is not sweet at all. Behold, it is bitter as gall. That's what Tutmosis said. Now, God, God can, and yes, he will, he will elevate his own people to great heights if if they if they're humble okay if they're humble and they're obedient to god think about the ring that we see pharaoh give to joseph that was that's a very valuable gift to give it, it's a, like i said it's a signet ring it had his seal on it and for him to give it to joseph he was given him very great authority the fine linen that we see him give him. These were, were probably white, like this, right? And that is a priestly robe, okay? Like I said, Pharaoh, he can see God's hands are on Joseph, okay? And then you have to, then you have what? You have this gold chain that he gives to him. This all shows that Joseph is someone who is of great distinction. Do you want to know the best part about all this? Joseph is now Potiphar's boss. Isn't that awesome? All of Egypt, all everyone in Egypt, they're ordered to bow to Joseph. Look at all of this story, okay? And I want you to look at it. Just As we're going along, I want you to look at it and tell me. That you cannot see a shadow of Christ here. Amen. So let's look at verse 44. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot 
in all the land of Egypt. Did you read that? It says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Let's remember this. Pharaoh means king. Okay? So, uh, what this is saying, what, what Pharaoh is saying here is, I am king. Again, I need to remind you of what Josephus says. Because Josephus says, this is not his name, it's his title. Okay? I'm only saying this to make sure that you remember that. So, like I said, he's reminding Joseph this. He's saying, hey, I'm giving you a high honor here, but I am still the king. All right? Sorry, my computer is... My notes are getting all jumbled here. <laughs> so, what this does is it shows Joseph that Joseph has the authority to do what he needs to do. Okay? He, he would be... He would stand beside, as long as he needs to, as long as this, Joseph is in that office, Pharaoh will stand beside him. Pharaoh will support him, okay? And Joseph is doing the same. Joseph is standing beside Pharaoh, and Joseph is supporting Pharaoh, but Pharaoh is still king. He still is the main, he is still the ruler over Egypt. Joseph's power comes, Joseph's authority, if you will, comes from Pharaoh. Kind of how, um... A cop's authority comes from the city. Okay? Then we see this. And without thee shall not a man lift up his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. Now, this is not being literal. Okay? I, I, I feel I have to say that. I feel I need to remind you that this is just a proverbial saying. Because all, it's, all that this verse is saying is that nothing is going to be done in inside of Egypt unless Joseph gives the okay. Alright, continuing on, verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephnath Pana, and he gave him in wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Reading again, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paniah. I did a little research on that name. Yes, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Not properly. But I did do a little bit of research. And the closest thing that I could find was that it means the salvation of the world. But there are several others that, that have, have been suggested as the, the meaning as well. But still, there is no certain translation of that. But yes, Egypt was known to give foreigners an Egyptian name. One translation of that name that I do want to look at is uh, was was the, the translation given by Ankelos. Because he says that the name is meant to signify one to whom hidden things are revealed. Jonathan, he says, a revealer of secrets. A lot of Jewish writers agree on this. And they say that this was the meaning. Because of what you know, how Joseph interpreted the dreams for Pharaoh, um, you know, as to, and, not, and not to mention what happened because of that. The verse then says this, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar. When we look at that name, I want you to know that Jarkey points out that this is not Potiphar, which, it, 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 you know, who, it's not. She's not the daughter of the Potiphar who was Joseph's master, but. Again, if you look at the names, the names are different, right? So are their jobs, right? And, and, and so that makes sense. I do not, I do not think that Joseph would have married the daughter of, of Potiphar's wife anyway. Don't forget all the trouble that she's already caused him. So this woman that we're reading about here was an Egyptian. She was this whoever Potiphar's was. She was his daughter, and. and uh, we see that Potty Pharaoh was um, a, a, a priest of On. It, it's possible that this On, O N, is the Avan, A V E N, that we read about in Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 17. Let me see if I can find that real quick. The young men of Avon and of Pibeseth shall fall by the sword 
and these cities shall go into captivity. Uh, now that of uh, that on right there or Avon is about 22 miles from Memphis. They are they also say that uh, that this is Heliopolis, Heliopolis. Okay? Um, that's what we see when we look at the Septuagint, which as you know, that mean um, Heliopolis means the city of the sun. Uh, it's also the same as Beth Shemesh, meaning the house of the sun. Take, let's take a look at something. Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 13. He shall break also the images of Beth Shemesh that is in the land of Egypt, and the houses of the and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians shall he burn with fire. Now the verse says this. It says, And Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Aben Ezra says that this just means that his name, his fame, if you will, went went all over Egypt. Everybody knew who he was. Uh, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 4 verse 24. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. And those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he held them. Or you could take it literal, meaning that uh, Joseph went and traveled all over Egypt, taking a tour, if you will, all throughout the land. He, what he did, what he would have been doing, was just going to see just how fruitful Egypt was. And choosing where he would then go and build these storehouses. So first off, I want to look at the meaning of a couple of names. That, and I, I always feel it's very important that we look at the names and what they mean because it usually points something out about that particular person. So let's look at Zaphnath Pania, which, like I said earlier, means it, through my research, uh, salvation of the world. And then when we look at Joseph's wife. A Sinath. Her name means she who is of Neath. So we know that she's the daughter of a very priestly family. And also remember this the Egyptians worshipped the sun. But if you remember what I told you a while back, and no, I won't go into this very much, I just feel it's important that we, we look at this. A lot of people believe that she was a Hebrew. And also remember this, Joseph, he has power uh, that is, it's not some local power. This is a very kingly power. He has power over all of Egypt, right? Let's look at verse 46 now. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Pharaoh. Again, this one is important. Very important. We see right here. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This tells us just how old he was when he stood right there before Pharaoh. When he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. As well as, it get, as, well as him getting the honor of being made prime minister. This tells us that Joseph had been in Egypt for, for at least 13 years. For a short time, he, he was in the house of Potiphar for a short period of time. He was in uh, prison for, again, a short period of time. Because let's remember, he was 17 when he was sold into Egypt. We see that back in chapter 37, verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren 
And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, this would have been about 1884 B.C. It had been about it had been only 13 years since he was, <laughs> well, involuntarily taken away from the land of the Hebrews. Uh, as we see it called back in chapter 40, verse 15. We also see Joseph went out, right? He went out from the presence of Pharaoh. This just means that he wasn't standing in front of him anymore, right? He, he was not ministering to him, if you will. Uh, so, so it could just be said that he went out of the court or out of the palace, if you want. The verse then says this, and went throughout all the land of Egypt. This this could have been a second tour of Egypt, right? The first one was, of course, you know, when he went and surveyed the land and he picked places to put granaries. This time he went out to gather in, right, to, to give directions to uh, make sure that it was done properly. Again, he, right here we see Joseph is another type of Christ. I want you to remember Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. Joseph started working in Egypt when he was 30 years old. Both of these were done at the command of God. Verse 47. And in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handfuls. Read that again. And in the seven Plenteous years, the earth brought forth in handfuls. Meaning the gatherers, they, they were using their hands when they reaped. It was a way of binding up the sheaves, as that song says. The fruitfulness of the land during these seven years was so big that even the stalk produced as many ears as a man could hold in his hands. That's what Ben Malik says. Again, this shows us that it was not some... This was not ma, what we call corn, which is maize. Now, Ankelos, he paraphrased this one. What Ankelos said was, The inhabitants of the earth in the seven years of the plenty gathered even into their treasuries. So, they of course would have done this because Joseph told them to. You know, he was passing through and he was telling this. So, meaning, he bought it from them and, and he had them put it in their grain in the granaries. So let's look at verse 48 now. I'm sorry my phone's over here. I probably should quiet that while we... I get a lot of... Um, Messages from the Order of Exorcists, which I'm part of. There. It's quiet now. Sorry about that. So let's look at verse 48. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. So it says, and he gathered up all the food of the seven years. He did the, and now, I want to make sure you understand, this does not mean all of the food, all right? This just means the, the corn, the wheat, okay? The grain of the land. And even then, it, was, it wasn't all of it, all right? It was just what we saw him say earlier, the fifth. And remember... He didn't take it. He bought it with Pharaoh's money. And he did it so he could sell it later, like he does. The verse then says this, which were in the land of Egypt. Why just the land of Egypt? Because that was Pharaoh's main concern. That, that was where the plenty was. And those storehouses that they built for this, they, these, these storehouses were in the cities that... The reason they're there is to make it easier for people to get it to it, and um, and get and 
not only get it there when they needed it, but also for them to take it there because it's closer to them. The verse then goes on to say, The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. That is smart. Think of how convenient it was for people to go there during the famine. In Old Cairo, there is an edifice, and this edifice is called Joseph's Granary. It, it, it occupies a square, and it's surrounded by a wall. It has four partitions, and these four partitions were where the grain would have been deposited. The grain was, was paid as a tax to the uh, Grom Signor. So we see Joseph is carrying out the plans that he, he, that he talked about with Pharaoh. The crops, like Joseph said, they were plentiful. And Joseph began to store it up, getting it ready for when the famine occurs. Verse 49. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering. That, may, that, that is hard. Not, not only was that hard for me to say, it was hard for me to understand until I did a little research. So I'm going to try to, to uh, explain it to you a little bit. What, what I gathered as I was doing my research is that at first, Joseph was keeping account. He was counting up how much he was taking in. Right? Now, you know how much was put into each granary. I don't either because he gathered up so much that it became too much. He wasn't able to number it. It was, as the verse says, like the sand of the sea. Meaning there was way too much for him to account for. This does not mean only the grain of corn. Okay? Even the measure of it. Whatever measure they were using, it became too much. For them to keep account of. That's a lot. A lot of food. So let's look at verse 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons. Before the years of famine came. Which Asenath the daughter of Potiphera. Priest of On. Bare unto him. So let's look at that again. And unto Joseph were born two sons. Now did you notice how the word for born is singular. Look at it again. Born two sons. This actually led Ben Melick to believe that it's possible these two sons were twins. The verse three goes on to say this, before the years of famine came. I think that it should say the year of famine because it means before that first year happened. The verse then says this, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare him. I believe that this was put here to show us that Joseph and her were married when, the, when these kids were born. Because when we look at Artipanus, Artipanus says that Joseph married the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis, but by, I mean, by, by whom he had children. We also can see that another heathen writer mentions their names, which, of course, are, as we know, Ephraim uh, and Manasseh. We also see another mention of On here, which, like I told you before, was one of the four great Egyptian cities. That, that, that It's also called Heliopolis, and it was very well known um, as the city of the sun god Ra. It, it was located 19 miles north of, of ancient Memphis. Joseph Joseph had some very good uh, progress in his duties and, and now he of course has two sons. Looking at the next two verses we're going to see this. We're going to see Manasseh, we're going to see Ephraim, which are their names and their names mean forgot, forgetful and fruitful. When we see these names assigned to his sons, uh, we also see why. We see their explanations. We can see that, that God was central in Joseph's life. All these years of him suffering 
or or, or, or even the, the, the pagan presence and, and being not only that but being separated from his family none of that harmed his faith so let's look on verse 51 and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh for God said he hath made me forgetful all my toil and all my father's house so it says Joseph ha- you know Joseph he, we, we know bleh, we know Joseph has two sons uh, we, we know that they're named Manasseh and, and Ephraim the firstborn was of course Manasseh and his name means one who causes me to forget and then we see a reference a reference to Joseph's toil to uh, to Joseph's father's house this of course means the hardship that had fell on him you know because of what his brothers had done to him at this point like we discussed before Joseph's been in Egypt for over 13 years he put all of those trials all of those tribulations behind him everything had turned out fine and now notice this something that we we should have something that we should all take notice of in the in the in the good times and also in the bad times Joseph praises God. This is something that we should all do. And we see that that he for, he had forgotten all of the hurt that his brothers caused when they sold him. We should praise God whether it's whether the the outcome of something is good or bad. It doesn't matter because God's still with you whether it's a good thing whether it's a bad thing. We should learn from Joseph this. Because Joseph praises God in the good times and the bad times. He doesn't turn his back on God because something bad happened to him. He doesn't fall to his knees and beg, God, why me? I'm not saying I'm not guilty of that either. But that's something that we see with Joseph that we should all do. We should all learn to praise God in the good times and the bad times. So, verse 52 And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So Joseph's second son is Ephraim, and his name means fruitful. We see the reason why he named him this. It says, God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Look at him here. He's, Joseph is, he's sweet. He, he's pleasant. He's thankful, isn't he? Those dreams that Pharaoh set, the Pharaoh, uh, those dreams of Pharaoh, had set the stage for this final scene and God fulfilling Joseph's dreams. So look at the names again. We have Manasseh. Manasseh means that he forgot, and then Ephraim. Double fruit, amen. Verse fifty-three. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of plenteousness that were in the land of Egypt were ended. I think that this happened very quickly. Right after his sons were born. That's my opinion here. And I'll tell you why. Notice how it's the very next verse. We do not know from earlier that you know they were born before the famine started that's all we know i saw where some say that some historians say that this verse and the last verse should be connected with moreover when meaning when those seven years were ended and the famine began in the next few verses we're going to see the use of that particular hyperbole all okay this of course is used to show how how widespread that famine was way beyond the borders of Egypt Egypt had become exactly what it was called the breadbasket of the ancient world verse 54 and the seven years of dearth began to come According as Joseph had said, and the dearth was in all lands, but in all the lands of Egypt 
there was bread. Do you see that there? All lands and then all the lands. So the verse says, And the seven years of dearth began to come as Joseph had said. Just like we read in the dreams of Pharaoh. Pretty simple, right? As soon as those seven years of plenty ended, the famine began. Since the Nile was now flowing at a, at, at a, well, I should say, since the Nile is now not flowing as it should be, um, and that showed there was a drought, right? The earth, it, beca it, it became parched. The ground was probably, being in Louisiana, when we would have like a drought come, you could actually walk out on the beach. Well, we called it a beach, but it was more like the, the bank of the river. And you could actually see where the ground would crack and break. I remember as a kid, every time I would see that, I was always like, man, that, that's just weird how, how it all cracks up. But anyway, I bet you that that was going on. The, the, the land was cracking. Everything around it started to, uh, to wither and decay. It was probably dead fish on the banks rotting. Everything around it. The seeds that were planted probably didn't spring up. The verse says, and the dearth was in all lands, all lands, you see that? All the lands, especially the ones that were connected to Egypt. Countries like Syria, Arabia, Palestine, Canaan, all of these. The verse then says, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So this is saying it in the hands of everyone, Okay. As well as, you know, what they had in, this, in the storehouses. None of it had been exhausted. Not yet. And, and they had it for... <coughs> they had it for a long time after this all started. And this shows us that it was not just Egypt, okay? It was also in all of the surrounding countries as well. There was food in Egypt. Why? Because Joseph did what God commanded him to do. And in the next two verses, I want you to pay attention. Because we see the Pharaoh say something. He says, go unto Joseph. This tells us that even after seven years of authority, Joseph's authority still remained intact. Pharaoh still trusted Joseph. Joseph sold the food to the Egyptians as well as everyone else. So we're going to be looking at verse 55 now. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, where he saith, what he saith to you, do. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, meaning when they had eaten up all of, all of what they had stored, they came to Pharaoh. And we see the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Since Pharaoh is the father of the country, they knew that he stored up provisions for them. And he did it in all of the cities um, just for something like just, in, just for when something like this was going to happen. The verse says this, And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph. Joseph was the man that he appointed to handle this. To, to lay up the grain for this person particular purpose to be the one to distribute it amen the verse then says this what he saith to you do meaning pay whatever it is he asks this is this was what they were supposed to do they were supposed to go to joseph give him money and get corn meaning wheat the grain of the land remember this was the authority that pharaoh gave to joseph Pharaoh will not overrule Joseph on this particular issue. Verse 56 says this, And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the, fam and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. So we read that part of the, the opening again. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. This time we see that word. All. And it's used here as a hyperbole. 
This does not mean the whole world, okay? Just the land of Egypt. Everyone pinched in. The rich, the poor, it reached all of them. The verse says, And Joseph opened all the storehouses, all the cities that he had laid up the corn in. The verse says, And sold unto the Egyptians. Remember, he bought this grain with Pharaoh's money. There's no injustice here. He could sell it at a moderate price, and still Pharaoh would earn his money back. Remember this, he bought it cheap. And since Joseph was a kind and benevolent man, he sold it at a reasonable price. And then we see, in the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt, there was no overflow year. Okay? No overflow year. Year after year, there was no grain in the old storehouses. Only what they had in the big storehouse, the main storehouse. I want you to think about it. Not only had Joseph saved up food for the Egyptians, he added to the wealth of Pharaoh. He was selling food to starving people. Okay, so we're here in the last verse of the chapter, verse 57, and it says, And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because the famine was so sore in all the lands. And all countries came to Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn. All of them. All those neighboring countries. All the ones I mentioned earlier. They heard about the grain that was in Egypt. That they could go there and buy it with money. And so they came. They were glad to get it at such an expense and trouble. The verse then says, Because that the famine was so sore in all lands. They didn't have any bread. They didn't have any, any wheat back home to make bread. And since they couldn't do that, they couldn't make money. It's believed that this was because Joseph was so careful in preserving Egypt. It's also believed that the Egyptians worshipped Joseph, worshipped Joseph under many names. And one of them that I found was Apis, who was an ox, which is a sign for fruitfulness. Another one I found was Serapis. Serapis is often shown as a young man carrying a basket of bread on his head. And, and some have even said Osiris, who, who's also sometimes shown with a bushel on his head, right? Now, one thing that you and I can be certain of, and that is how Joseph is a type of Christ. How, how he went from humiliation to exaltation. Joseph was wrongfully charged by his mistress. Jesus was wrongfully accused by the Jews. Joseph was cast into prison and bound there. Jesus was taken and bound as a prisoner. Joseph was raised to honor and glory by Pharaoh. Jesus was exalted by his father and, and crowned with glory and honor. And then you have the name. Zaphnath Pania. Right? Which means what? I told you earlier. Savior of the world. That agrees with Jesus. Who was sent for that reason. If you go with the meaning. Revealer of secrets. Yes. That suits Jesus as well. He declared his father's mind and will. Didn't he? Revealing the mysteries of His grace to the sons of man. Just like how we see Joseph store up the grain under his care, the needy were told to go to Joseph to get it. Jesus, Jesus has all the treasures of grace in His hand. Everyone who is, everyone who is has the sense to know they need it. We're told to go to Jesus, go to Jesus to receive it. It's only through Jesus that all of us, you, me, every man, every woman from every country and every nation, it's only through Jesus that we receive grace for grace. 
And through Him, all of our surplus, our spiritual sustenance, our nourishment, all of it is provided. <coughs> anyway, when we're looking at Joseph here, he's feeding all of the countries around Egypt, making money for Pharaoh. He's ready because all of this is ready. Right? So I want you to all just be ready because next week we will see that we will see that dream that Joseph had so many years ago when he saw the sun. He saw the moon. He saw the stars. And they all came down and they bowed before him. Next week, we're going to see all of that come true. So, I want to thank you all for joining me here. I pray that um, you've got something out of this. I pray that uh, you, you were... <laughs> That this was worth you waiting for because like I always love doing standing here and doing these with you every Sunday. Uh, it's just you know last week my job had me working seven days, so I wasn't able to uh, to to record the video in time for you guys. So I wanted to do something special, and I had already planned that early morning interview with Robbie, and um, we were able to get that done, and I was able to get that out to you both on YouTube and on the podcast. So thank you again for joining me here. I pray the Lord continues to bless and keep each and every one of you, and I'll see you all next week for an all-new Sermons in the Park. And who knows, maybe tomorrow I'll have a new podcast episode up for you too. So thank you all. I love you. God bless you. You have been listening to Sermons in the Park with Reverend Jamie McCaskill. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, BitChute, and Rumble. And as always, thank you for listening. I was born